Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Web Programming with Python and JavaScript. Today, we're joined by some special guests from GitHub and Travis, which you recall we've been using in order to do version control and CI and CD. And they'll be here today to continue those conversations about what we can use version control and CI and CD for. And so first up, we have uh, John from GitHub, who's joined us today to talk to us about how we can use GitHub in order to work on our web applications. I'm looking forward to uh, having, spending some time with you, building some, uh, building some cool features. Uh, so just an overview of what we're going to do today. Um, I'm going to walk through the development, uh, the development flow that we use at GitHub to work on web applications. So we're primarily a software as a service company. We build web apps. Um, so I'm going to walk you through kind of like what a typical day would look like for me uh, in working on you know, some Ruby on Rails code um, for GitHub Classroom. So GitHub Classroom, as you probably already know, is an application for teachers and for students to use uh, GitHub for learning how to code. And I think you're using it in CS50. Uh, already or in, the, in this course. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Uh, the first thing that I'm going to do is just hop into GitHub and go to the repository. Uh, this is the GitHub Classroom repository. So it's an open source code, a Ruby on Rails app. Um, you can see there's you know, different stuff going on here. Uh, you can watch it. There's a bunch of stars. Uh, all the code is down here. And then you can check out the README. Um, if you're interested in, in developing, you know, getting involved in open source, um, I chose this project because it is an open source project. I'm a maintainer on this project. And if you're interested, you can send a pull request, open issues, um, and I'll be able to interact with you. Um, also, it's great because it's open source. I can easily use it as an example here. Um, this code powers, uh, powers a website, uh, GitHub Classroom, which if we log out here, is just a tool for creating programming exercises and distributing them to uh, students or people in your course um, to do coding exercises on GitHub. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through the process of developing a feature using Git, uh, making a branch, running our unit tests, um, sharing with our peers, getting feedback via pull request, uh, deploying to production, and also uh, doing something that we, we call like feature flipping. Uh, which is an approach to bringing out features to a live production application and slowly rolling them out over time or to specific people. Um, so the first thing that we need to do, um, and you can kind of follow along with this. Uh, I'm probably going to move too fast for you to keep up, but um, you know, I want this to be kind of a tutorial of like what you could do on your own time. Um, so the first thing to do here is in the top right-hand corner of the repository, there's a fork button. And if you go ahead and click that, it will let you create a copy of the repository in your personal account. Um, I've already done that. So if I go to my browser and just type in my username here, um, you'll see that I have a, a fork. It says fork from Education Classroom. So this is the public open source main repository. And I have a copy of this repository in my personal GitHub account. Then what you would do from there is go to this clone button right here and click on that and just grab the URL and hop over to your terminal. In your terminal, you would do git clone and paste in that URL. So now you can get a copy of the repository on your local machine with all the code for the app so you can run it locally and, uh, and get started. I've already cloned it just for the, the speed of this demo. So if I move into my source repository location, um, we can go ahead and run git status. And you can see that I have the master branch. Everything is working. Um, and if you want to look at the files, there's all these files and gems and cool stuff in here. Um, we follow a pattern on our repositories of scripting everything. Uh, so we want it to be, uh, for a new contributor coming to our project, be really easy to set up. So within the project, there's actually this uh, file uh, in the scripts directory. So in here. We've got script. And inside there, we have a uh, file called Bootstrap. You run that, and it will just set up your entire machine. The only prerequisite for this app is to have Docker installed. So you install Docker on your machine, you run script Bootstrap, and you should be off to the races to get this running locally. Um, in my case, I'm just going to go ahead and run script server. So after you've set everything up, you launch the server. You can see Docker is booting up the different, uh, the different services and different containers. And then uh, if things go well, we'll have a locally running version of the application. Takes just a moment. 
So there we go. It says it's done. It's starting the Docker services. Connection succeeded. And if we switch over to our browser, I'll put this over here, put the browser over here. Um, we can do HTTP localhost 5000. Once that finishes loading up, you can see the different services running and putting out their output. And then the Rails server is running. Now it's loading. Great. So we have a locally running copy of the application. Um, doesn't look like much right here. It's just a landing page. So we'll go ahead and sign in and just see how it works. Uh, you can see a lot of stuff happening in the background in my console. But basically what's happening is it's connecting to my GitHub account, and it's logging me in as my user uh, on GitHub on this application. And it shows this is kind of what the teacher sees uh, when they're using GitHub Classroom. It's kind of an overview of all their classrooms. It shows them what, um, what students they have, what assignments they've created, who submitted what when. Um, and we're just going to add like a really simple feature. We're going to go ahead and add a, uh, a link to Harvard CS50 in the navigation. So we're not going to do any actual programming. We're just going to add a little bit of HTML um, as a sample of how, um, how this process works. Now, we're going to, once we dive into the code, um, we're going to use the feature branch, uh, a feature branch development strategy. So at GitHub, and commonly on teams that work on uh, software as a service, web applications, it's very common to kind of take your project, make a branch, do a little bit of development off to the side just on one specific feature, and then merge it back into master, where the master branch, the main line of development for your project, represents production. That's what we do on GitHub Classroom. The master branch is what's in production. We do a, a single feature branch, and we go off to the side, and we do some work, and then we merge it back in, and we deploy it right away. So this is the idea of continuous deployment. We can deploy GitHub.com hundreds of times a day. Uh, we use the same flow on GitHub.com, uh, but I use this as the example because it's open source. Um, a, contra like a, a different way of doing this is kind of release-based development. And I think this is really common in desktop applications or any kind of software that goes in a package and is shipped out, uh, something that you might see like version 1.0, version 2.0, version 3.0 of the software. Um, and generally what happens in those cases is you have like a main line of development. You branch off for a new release. And you'll say, like, this is the 1.0 branch. And your developers will be just putting lots of stuff into the 1.0 branch. And eventually, that 1.0 branch might get merged back into master. Um, but in the meantime, there could be a, a, a 1.1 branch started so that you can simultaneously be working on the, the, the upcoming release and like maybe one release down the road um, for six months later. Um, but in our case, I'm going to focus just on this uh, feature branch development mode where we just make one branch for each feature or one branch for each bug, re bug report. And we merge that in and just kind of keep going. So I'm going to open up another terminal. And you'll see that I have my repository cloned down locally. Um, on the right-hand side of my terminal, that just says what branch I'm on and the current status of my repository if I ran git status. So every time um, I do something, that will automatically update. Um, and the first step here is to get onto another branch. We need to make a branch uh, to work on the side. So we'll use the command git checkout dash b. Git checkout allows you to select a branch and make it active. And the dash b flag lets you create the branch at the same time. So I'll just call this Harvard. I'll make the branch. You'll notice on the right-hand side, it's updated. I'm on the Harvard branch. Um, the next thing that I'm going to do here is open up my text editor. So I'm using Atom, which is GitHub's text editor. Um, and I'm going to open up a file called header.html. So this is um, on every page of, let's see here. On every page of the site, you'll see we have this header. And it has like GitHub Education link, uh, a link to our forums, a link to some video tutorials, different stuff up here. And this, all of this is contained in this file. So I'm going to make a change to that. What I'm going to do is just copy this um, you know, GitHub Education link. And I'm going to just paste another copy of it and save it and refresh. And so now you see I have the link twice. You know, we're, we're editing the, real, you know, the, the local development environment. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and call this Harvard. And then I'm going to link to harvard.edu. Now, obviously, this isn't a feature that we really want in the app. But you could imagine that I'm, I'm making some new feature, like uh, the ability to grade assignments or the ability to 
um, invite people or, or different, different kinds of things. Uh, the important part here is that we're doing some kind of development um, on the app in a branch on the side, and that we can discuss it and share it with people uh, on GitHub. So I go ahead and save that. And the next thing that I'm going to do is go back to my terminal and do git status. Git status, um, I, know, I know you've covered some of git in this course already. Um, but git status, just as a refresher, tells you um, what's going on in your working directory and in your staging area, and what kind of the next thing you should do. So it gives you some pointers. It says uh, right here, use git add file to update what will be committed. So what we need to do here is we need to use git add, and then app views shared header partial.html.erb. So what this is saying is I want to put this file that I've modified into my staging area and prepare it to be committed uh, as a new commit in my repository on the Harvard branch. So I do that. Git status reports that it's modified. And then the last step here is to do git commit. Uh, when you commit, you include a message. And I'll say, add a link to Harvard. I should probably check and make sure that uh, the link actually works. If I click it, it does, in fact, take us to Harvard. All right. So now we've made our first commit um, on this new feature development that we're doing. And I want to show you a little bit about um, how to switch back and forth. So the first thing uh, we did, we made a branch. We moved over to that branch. We made it active. We can, at the same time, use the command git checkout and specify a branch master to go back to our main line of development. This is the thing that's currently in production that everybody's using. I do that, and I refresh this page. And you'll see that the link to Harvard disappeared. It's not on this branch. If I go git checkout Harvard, and I refresh, it's now on this branch. And this is like pretty accurate as to how I would be working normally. I would make a branch, do some stuff, run it in development, see how it's going, and just keep checking things as I go until I get to the point where I'm like, yes, this is the thing I want. I want to push it out to production. It works. Um, now I need to get code review and run some unit tests to make sure that my, uh, what I'm doing is right. So, um, again, we started by forking the repository, and we had it in our own account. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to push it to my copy. I'm not going to push it to the main GitHub Education copy. I'm going to push it to my copy. So what I'll do is say git push John D. Britton uh, Harvard. And in this case, John D. Britton is the name of my remote that represents the repository, my fork of the repository. So it's here. It's this one. So that's what the, that, that means. So I'm going to push to that. And I'm going to push to the branch called Harvard. So this branch, I'm going to push it to a, a branch with the same name remotely. So you can see it pushes the code up to GitHub on my repository. And if I refresh the page on GitHub, you'll see that, um, let's see here, if I go to the home page, there you go. This yellow box says that less than a minute ago, I pushed a branch called Harvard to GitHub on my personal GitHub repository. And I can click this button here, Compare and Pull Request. So I'll do that. What a pull request does is it lets you kind of start a conversation about some code, about some changes that you made. Um, so this, in this case, I'm just going to say I want to add a link to Harvard. And up at the top, because this is a fork, you'll see um, it's saying I want to merge from my version of the repository on the Harvard branch to GitHub Education, the official version on the master branch. I'm going to change this just to be my own version. Um, so I'm going to merge my Harvard branch into my own version's master branch, uh, just because I don't actually want to deploy this to our production instance. Um, so I'm going to add a link to Harvard like that and just say, this is a simple example of uh, feature branch development for the Harvard course. All right, And I can just say, create pull request. What happens is it automatically starts a build. Um, so it goes off to Travis, and it says, John made this branch. Um, he, ran, he, he made some new code. I want you to run all the tests. So what does that mean? Let's look at our tests. While this is uh, kind of doing some stuff in the background, um, I'm going to hop over to my, um, my editor. And if we go here and go to uh, spec. So in here we have, let's zoom in. Uh, within our repository of this folder, so it's a Rails application. We're using RSpec. 
all of our specifications, all of our unit tests are within this one folder called spec. Um, we have all these different kinds of, of, of specs. We have controller specs, we have helpers, we have uh, background job specs, we have model specs, service specs. Um, and each one of these things, so if I say, for example, I'll go into my model specs, uh, and I'll go in here and I'll check like the deadline specification. Um, what this does is make sure that when a teacher sets a deadline, that we close down assignment submission on the deadline. And if somebody tries to submit, it gives an error. So there's all these different, uh, different checks. Um, in our case, our change was very minor. We just added a visual change. But we could have accidentally introduced some kind of bug, some kind of error. And so by running the tests, we're able to guarantee that nothing has changed. Nothing is broken. Uh, nothing important has broken anyways, because we have tests for everything that's important. So there's hundreds and hundreds of these tests. They're all running. And if I go in here and click on the uh, Travis CI uh, link, and I go to our build, it's building on different versions of Ruby. Um, so I'll open up this one. And you can kind of see it's setting all of our environment variables. It's installing all kinds of, um, you know, all of our different, oops. There we go. So yeah, what it actually says here, we're not going to go through every one of these tests, obviously, but it's, it's running all the tests. Uh, and then you can see as they run that they're passing, and it's kind of live updating. So this takes a, a couple of minutes. Um, once that's done, I'll get a green kind of status uh, update on my repository on the pull request saying that, yes, in fact, this did pass all the tests. So you should feel very confident about deploying this to production. Uh, in the meantime, what would commonly happen um, is my coworkers would come in or, you know, other people on the open source project would come in and review the changes. Um, in our case, the change is rather trivial. Um, so I'll just come in here and just say, like, this, you know, this looks great. And I'll zoom in on that. This looks great. Let's ship it, right? Add a comment. And so we can collaborate on that. Um, what would be pretty common to see here is say um, you, you did something, there might be a security concern. Somebody from your security team could come in and, and give comments about you know, what you need to check, make sure that it's, uh, you're following best practices, kind of give you a second set of eyes so that you end up in a position where you're writing the best code you can. Um, it's going to take a, a couple of minutes for this to run. Um, so I want to jump to uh, jump back to the uh, code. So we're going to cover uh, a few things. We did branches. We made a pull request. Um, we're doing an automated build. We got some review. Um, and then we're going to talk about deploying. Um, so every, uh, every setup is different, You know how you're going to deploy your project. Uh, in our case, we use our chat tool. Uh, so we have a, a shared chat kind of chat room thing. And every time we make a change, those changes get propagated to our, um, to our chat tool as like kind of a notification. And then we can run a command in our chat client that says uh, we have a bot. His name's Hubot. Um, and we tell Hubot, Hubot, go deploy GitHub Classroom to production. And we can even specify, go deploy this branch of GitHub Classroom to production. So I could say, um, for example, um, where is my, here we go. Uh, so for example, in here, I could say, for example, uh, deploy classroom. Uh, Harvard to production. I'm not going to run this right now, but essentially, if I wanted to deploy this out to production, that's exactly what I would do. And as you can see from before, I deployed Classroom, the master branch. Hubot replied to me that I was deploying. Uh, I got a success. I got a success uh, option, and then it said it was finished. Um, so let's check in on Travis. Okay, our build. Um, wait, this is not the right one. We had one build. Fail and one build pass. I don't know why we failed. This one will restart. All right. So, anyways, we go back to where did our thing go? Oh, I have to press the back button. I lost my tab. So, if we go back here, um, anyways, this pull request build passed. So let's check that one out. So ultimately, we ran all of the uh, all of the tests. You can see them all passing here. So I feel pretty confident that the change I made by adding a link to the navigation, I didn't break anything. Um, 
So I could go ahead and merge this in into the master branch and be totally, totally happy. However, um, this is a pretty common, a common path to take when you're doing um, kind of smaller features. You build it, you test it, you make sure it works, you get code review, you put it out there. But what happens when you're doing like a really big feature? Um, if you're doing release-based development, you might lump all of those changes together into one big release and say, this is the new release that supports this new thing. But when you're doing continuous deployment uh, with a web application, you can't really do that. It's diverging from the production version is your enemy. The longer you have a branch open where you're making changes, making changes, making changes, and not reintegrating that back to the main line of development, the harder you're making your life for the future. So what we like to do is use feature toggles. So we'll create a kind of uh, a break, uh, a logical break in the code where you can choose two code paths based on certain variables. And that allows us to deploy new features to the public production version of our, uh, of our website or our app without impacting all of our users immediately. So practically speaking, what does this mean? This means that I want to be able to deploy this new feature that links to Harvard to production, but I want it to be disabled by default. So I want nobody to see it. I just want that code to be in production and ready to go whenever I need it. And I want to be able to enable it for one person at a time. So I want to be able to say, when John accesses, accesses this web page, then it, will show, um, it should show the Harvard link. But when anybody else accesses it, it should not. So that's called a feature toggle. And I'm going to show you how we kind of build those and, um, and deploy them into production. So um, I'll go back to my header. And it's pretty straightforward. We have one line here, this line number seven, which links out to Harvard. What we want to do is add a conditional around it. The conditional should be based off of the current user. And it should be based off of if the Harvard feature is enabled or not enabled. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use some Ruby syntax to say I'm writing uh, logic code. And I will say if current user dot feature enabled question mark, and then I'll call the feature Harvard. Right? Simple if statement. If the feature is enabled, I want to link to Harvard. And that's it. And then I just say end to end the statement. If the feature is not enabled, do nothing. Okay, so I'll save that. Now if I go back to my browser and go to my local, uh, local copy, you can tell that this is my local copy because it's got this red bar across the top, which is kind of development mode for us. Um, and you can see the Harvard link is here. If I refresh this page, it's gone. Okay, That's because the, fa the, the, the feature is not enabled. Uh, up here in the top, there's this uh, site admin button. Um, this links into kind of a back end for developers who work on this app. So if you're a developer working on the open source version of this app, you would have access to this through your, um, your copy of the app. Or if you were a GitHub staff employee uh, working on the production version, you'd be able to access this as well. Um, Within this interface, we link out to this thing called features. Right? And features, this, uh, this tool um, is actually an open source Ruby gem called Flipper. So it's uh, GitHub Flipper. Um, so here's the, here's the gem. Um, if you're interested in building apps that have feature flippers and you're using Rails, uh, this is definitely a, way to, a thing to check out. Um, it's probably too in-depth for me to go into all of how this, how this works, but I, we didn't build everything that I'm showing you uniquely for this app. Every Rails app that we use has the ability to do this feature flipper thing through a third party library. In JavaScript, there are other libraries that do this. Different frameworks have different libraries for this kind of thing. So this is a common pattern uh, in deploying production um, you know, web applications. And also desktop applications. We do this in some of our desktop apps as well. Um, so anyways, I'll click on the features uh, toggle. And it says there are no features. You need to add a feature. So I'll go in here and click Add Feature. And I'll call it Harvard right here, and then click Add Feature. And now I have this nice interface that shows me um, ways to enable the feature. I can enable the feature for a percentage of actors. That means um, if you have 100 users, enable it for one, or one in every 100, two, of, two out of every 100. Um, what's interesting about percentage of actors is that that is based off of the fact that when a feature is enabled for a given user, it stays enabled for that user all the time. It's very important that. If somebody goes to your website and the feature is enabled on one page and they navigate to the next page, it shouldn't disappear. So you can think about this as taking like a numerical, a numerical ID for the user and doing like mod some, something. And if it has a remainder or not, uh, it's enabled. 
So for a given user, it will always be enabled or not be enabled. Um, the other option is percentage of time. This allows the feature to be enabled basically for every request, one request out of 100. So for the same user, it might be enabled sometimes. It might not be. Uh, it just depends on what you're implementing. Um, and then lastly, there's uh, individual groups and individual actors. So I can enable a feature just for one user or just for one group. Since this is my development environment, I know my user ID is 1. So I'm just going to enable this for user 1. So I'll just enter this in here. Right? Click Add Actor. And now the feature is partially enabled. Uh, you can see it's yellow. And if I switch back, um, where did my thing go? Oh, it's, I have to go back here. If I switch back to my local host and load the page, you'll see that now the Harvard link is here. Now I'll open up a, a, a separate window, an uh, incognito window, and I'll go localhost 5000. And this time I'll log in as a different user. Uh oh, what did I do? Oh, let's disable this feature. What did I do here? Uh, 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 let's do this. I'll log in as a different user. Uh huh. And then in this case, I just have like a student, like a test account. I'll authorize this. So now I'm logged in in this browser window, which has the gray bar, as a different user. I'll go back to my code and fix that. And for this user, you'll notice that the Harvard uh, link is not enabled. But for this user, the Harvard li link is enabled. So I basically have a feature toggle in there that allows me to specifically say which users get, get what. Why is this useful? Um, this can be very useful if you do, um, when you're making new features, you can enable it just for your friends. Or you can enable it just for people who work at your company. Or you can enable it just for beta testers. So what this means is like the problem we were trying to solve before is that you can diverge from your main line of development. And the longer you stay diverging and you keep spreading apart, the harder it is to reintegrate your code later. This means that you can add a feature toggle, put in an unfinished feature or a beta feature, merge it in, and every, um, every time you improve it, just make a new pull request, a new branch, doing it bit by bit by bit, and you're always reintegrated. So you never have this big, scary day where you say, we made this huge new feature for the app. Now we have to integrate it with all the other work all the other developers have been doing. It's been integrated all along. So now you just click a button, and it's able, enabled. Then once you're happy with the feature and you know it's been working well, you can delete the code that lets you choose two paths and let it just have one path. Um, so if we go back um, to, our, to our feature toggle board and click on Harvard, I'll disable it for my user. And instead, I will enable it 50% um, of the time. So if I go to my, um, my private user and I refresh, it's not there the first request, not there the second request. Oh, there it is. Now you see it showed up right here. If I refresh it again, it might disappear. Eventually it comes back. So 50% of the requests. And that's true across all users. So if I go to my normal account, it would do that as well. Um, put it to 0. Uh, and then ultimately, you can just click Enable here, and it will enable for everybody all the time enabled for everyone. So now we're able to create a feature flag, um, push it out to production, and see it in action. So here we go. Um, in my case, what I want to do is uh, look at the code. We're happy with this feature toggle. Then we say git status. We have modified this file. We'll do git add app views shared header. And then git commit, which says enable Harvard feature behind a feature flag. All right, and lastly, I'll say git push John D. Britton Harvard. So this will push it up to my forked copy of the repository. And then that will run the builds again. I'll run all the unit tests again, make sure that it's good. Now, I'm also going to go ahead and push this. I'm not going to create a pull request for this on the main um, public project, but I do want to show you how deploying works. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say git. I want to do this uh, in here. I need to add one more thing. If current user and. Um, so I need this line 
because uh, you saw that error I got before. Because I was logged out, I wasn't a current user, so I caused the app to crash. I don't want to cause our production app to crash, so I'm going to add this if current user, and if the feature is enabled, then do this thing. Uh, otherwise, if there's nobody logged in, don't do anything, or if the feature is not enabled, don't do anything. So git add, um, what's it called? Git status, git add app views shared header, git commit dash m check for current user, git push Harvard, and I'm also going to do git push origin Harvard. So in this case, I'm actually going to push the change up to uh, the, the real production application's repository. And then what will happen is if I go in here, you'll see in my chat. So this is really important to the way GitHub works and the way we work with, with teams. Um, you can see I created the branch, and I got a notification in the chat room. All of the other people uh, on my team also got this notification, uh, and they'll see it in the chat room. What's interesting is like I'm doing all this work on my command line. You can all watch, and you can see it because I'm, I'm screen sharing. But my coworkers can't see any of the commands I'm running. The reason we have all of this stuff published out to our chat channel is because it gives visibility into what commands we're running to the entire group. So by using Hubot and using a chat tool, we're able to have kind of a shared command line where people can see what, um, what's happening in the deployment process. So um, in, in, um, in our chat tool, I can run CI build classroom Harvard. And what that's going to do is it's going to say, go to my CI tool. Uh -oh. Uh oh, that's not good. Well, it runs automatically as well. GitHub.com, education, classroom. If I go here, now you'll notice this is not the, um, the forked version of the repository. This is the actual version of the repository. I can go to this branch, and I'll see the Harvard branch. And you can see uh, the build is pending on Travis. So I can click this and see what's happening. Once this build finishes, um, I'll be able to actually deploy this out to production and try it out. So while this is building, um, does anybody in the, in the audience have uh, any questions while we wait for this for a sec? No? Yes, in the back. So the question was about uh, my command line being in the chat tool. Um, it's actually not that the command line is in the chat tool, but what I wanted to show is that um, while I was working on my command line, all my Git commands, they were private to me. Nobody could see them. But when it comes to deploying a product, deploying a service, um, it's important for the team to be in communication and know what's going on. So we don't actually deploy from our command line. We deploy from chat. So I'll, I'm about to demonstrate that as soon as the, uh, the builds finish. But I'll be able to go into our chat room. Actually, I can do it with the master branch. Um, while this builds. So I can go to our chat tool, and I can say, um, OK, you can see the build was successful. Uh, but I can say, for example, deploy classroom master. So I'm going to deploy the master branch of my app to production. And so now when I do this, everybody on my team can see that I'm currently doing deployment. Nobody else can deploy. The kind of the deploy queue is locked. Um, and you can see that my deployment uh, is done. It went out to production. I literally just deployed the app to production you know, as we were talking. But everybody else in the, in the team can see that I'm doing this. Does that answer your question? Yes. Cool. And how can you set up those, like, are those hooks that are set up? Yeah, so, so this is all set up via Hubot. Um, so it's an open source tool you could use um, to, build your, to kind of set up your own thing. Um, there's also this thing called the GitHub app, um, which is a it's, a, it's a Slack integration. You could enable this for your Slack, um, which is giving us all these notifications. All right, so now um, we can see right here, it says, Travis CI build successful, education classroom ref Harvard. So this is the branch that I, um, this Harvard branch is the one that I just made. So we can actually deploy it now. So I'm going to go ahead and deploy it to production. So deploy classroom Harvard. Now, hopefully, I don't break the whole, the whole thing. Um, it's deploying. 
And then once it's finished, I can actually go to the public GitHub Classroom website and take a look. Um, presumably, nothing has changed uh, because we, you know, we didn't actually change anything in the um, we didn't turn the, t the feature toggle on. So we just put some code out there that's now integrated with our code base, but it's not publicly, um, it's not running for anybody. And then we'll go and enable it and kind of walk through those steps. Takes a moment. So in the meantime, while it's doing that, I'll kind of walk through. Oh, it's finished. There we go. John's uh, production deployment of Harvard is done. Great. It took 80 seconds. So I can say classroom.github.com. App is running. It's not broken. I can sign in. You can see my normal classroom. There's no link about any of this stuff. Because I'm a staff member, I can go in here and click on this and go to the features thing. You can see we have some real features in here about deadlines, student identifiers, different kinds of features we've been adding recently. I can add a feature called Harvard. And then I can enable it for user one. And now if I go to classroom.github.com, you'll see, did I break it? Maybe I'm not user one. We'll enable it for staff instead. Oh, no. Well, the demo, the demo, live demo failed for this. But I will, uh, you should believe me, it does work. <laughs> we saw it work in development. So I'm just going to go ahead and do deploy classroom master and put things back how they were. So that unlocked. Um, production, it redeployed the master branch out there. Um, and this is actually like, the demo didn't work, but it's a very uh, similar experience to what would normally happen. Um, I would test it on my local environment, it would work, I'd have my tests run, the build would succeed, I would deploy it, I would go out and test it, make sure nothing's broken. Uh, if something's broken, I redeploy master, I go back to my development environment and try and figure out what's wrong. I don't know what I did wrong, um, but I'm not going to debug that right now. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically the, uh, the standard flow going from uh, just taking an open source project or a project working on with coworkers, doing a feature branching model, uh, you know, committing that stuff, sending it up to, uh, to GitHub, and then deploying it. I think what we didn't do in the case of deploying to production, which um, I just wanted to reduce the amount of noise for my, co my collaborators, was normally what I would have done is made a pull request in the production repo had a discussion about the feature, but then it, that would create noise for the hundreds of you know, hundreds of people who are on that repository. So I just kind of went around that for, for demo purposes. Um, but like we did on my fork, uh, we could do a whole conversation about what the features were and how it worked. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's what I had for, for that stuff. I wanted to go and offer up the opportunity for some questions around uh, kind of this flow, why we might choose certain things. So uh, I'd kind of throw it out to you all. No takers. There we go. Can you recommend a good resource for because I, I see there's a lot of components in here and a lot of like, setup yeah. required to have all of this uh, working. The, like the end to end the end to end thing. Yeah, like is there like a book or like does you have So I don't know about a book. Um, I would point to Travis, which you're gonna hear about next, um, as like kind of the go to place. I mean there's there's other tools. I like Travis, but there's other tools out there. But go to them and you can basically see um, you know how to set all this stuff up. What's cool about it too is um, I'll just show you my Travis CI um, account for this. So I can go to my Travis CI account, and basically I can list all of my GitHub repositories, and I just click a checkbox, and it just automatically works. Um, if you have any of the standard 
like frameworks. So say you're using a Rails app or a Node app or uh, basically every language kind of framework combo has a testing system. If you use the standard thing, um, all you need to do is have one point of entry to run the tests. So in our case, we do everything in scripts, and we have script CI build. And that's just, you know, if you have that one file that will run the test, then Travis can figure everything out automatically. And you don't have to configure GitHub at all. You just log into Travis, you click the button, and Travis configures GitHub for you. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's the best way to get started, is like go through their guides uh, on CI, CD. Um, there's also, um, and I guess I should plug this as well, um, developer.github.com. Um, so if you want to be a bit more sophisticated, I know a lot of uh, teachers are using this stuff for their, um, for like kind of customizing the way that they, they have workflows for their, their students and stuff. But if you want to use this for your own projects and you want to customize it, uh, you can just go to developer.github.com, uh, check out the, the API docs, and specifically uh, this section here on the webhooks. Um, what that does is it, it gives you basically a way to listen to events happening on github.com and respond to them. So the most common event that people listen to is the push event. Anytime somebody pushes code to GitHub, GitHub will send a web request to a URL of your choosing and notify them of what's changed. And then you can build an integration that does all kinds of stuff. Um, so that's like, if you want to get more custom, I would start on developer.github.com. If you want to have just the standard thing, go to like Travis or you know, another one of those services. And I, I should repeat the question, I guess, or is, is that, yeah. The, the, qu the question that that answered was, how do I, is there a resource where I can get started? Um, yeah. Just trying to understand Well, the test happened first. So the question was, I, I want to understand the deployment flow. Like, what are the steps and what are the pieces? Um, so first, we write the code. And we get the code hosted on GitHub. Then when the code gets pushed to GitHub, GitHub uses webhooks to trigger a build. That's all automatic. I don't do anything. Once the build is finished, or even before the build is finished, I can go into our chat channel. And that's actually one channel, Education Ops. It's all about this education stuff. Uh, and I just say, uh, period, deploy, um, and the name of the app. And we have Hubot in the room listening to commands. So any, any person who's authorized to use Hubot if they type a command in the channel, everybody can see it, and Hubot sees it. And when Hubot sees it, that triggers a flow for Hubot. Hubot doesn't actually do the deploying. So this app, in particular, is hosted on Heroku. So what Hubot does is it tells Heroku to get this new version of the app and have it be deployed into our production like pipeline. Um, so Hubot is kind of like a little bit of glue there. And the, the part we need Hubot for is so that we can do it in the chat room. Um, I could do this without being in the chat room. I could do it automatically when I deploy. And in fact, if I made a pull request with the changes and I just clicked Merge and I didn't talk to anybody about it, as long as the build passed, it would get deployed to production automatically without even talking to Hubot. Um, when I said that you can actually deploy before the build passes, what will happen is if you, if you type in deploy the app name before, um, you know, before it passes, then what will happen is Hubot will wait until the build passes. If the build fails, Hubot will tell you, sorry, your build failed. Fix your problems. Or your build succeeded. I'm deploying your app now. Um, so it, it kind of always does that. Uh, another kind of interesting component about that whole flow is um, you know, GitHub is a, getting to be a, a larger company. There are a lot of engineers there, a lot of people working on GitHub.com. Uh, there can be kind of a limitation on the number of people who can de be deploying at one time. Um, so we've kind of developed like a queuing system where it's like you get in line for your deployment. Um, so there's basically GitHub is like constantly being deployed, like nonstop, just deploy, 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 deploy. Whenever, whenever your uh, the the first deployment finishes, Hubot notifies the next person and starts their deploy, and like, there's just a whole a whole process. So they're always getting out there as fast as possible. Do we have any other um, other questions from folks? All right, well, then I think that we, uh, we may be finished up a little bit early, but uh, thank you very much. Um, do you want to yeah, come on up? Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and take about a five to 10 minute break, and then when we come back, we'll have uh, Anna from Travis talking to us. OK, welcome back. Uh, next up, we're going to be talking a little bit about Travis CI, which you may recall from last week when we talked about uh, testing in CI and CD for a bit. And so we have uh, Anna here from Travis, who's here to speak with us about Travis CI. Turn it over to Anna. Hi, I'm Anna. I'm a product manager and 
heading up involved in our education initiative. So I'm here to talk about uh, continuous integration, which if you are involved in software um, already, you may have, you certainly probably have come across this, If and I hope to go into enough detail that it's useful. If you haven't, we're going to like start from the top. So I work at Travis CI. We are a leading continuous integration platform. Um, it's essentially a tool for software engineers uh, to maintain quality and collaboration. We started in 2011 in open source, uh, moved to paid and enterprise over time. Uh, it's entirely GitHub based, so your GitHub repositories, talk to Travis if you would like them to. A uh, bit of a side note, microservices, Ruby, Go, Ember.js, it's cool stuff. Uh, you can find us also on github.com slash travis-ci. Also, we do have an education program, just to plug it real quick, education at travi uh, travisci.com. If you're on the GitHub education pack, which you all should be if you have a .edu, uh, go sign up. Um, if you have an organization club, contact us. And there's, uh, there was a question earlier, there are a couple docs um, down there for getting started, kind of background and stuff. So all that stuff is there, but docs.travis-ci.com, it'll get you all there eventually. We also uh, are involved in other education initiatives. So uh, through Rails Girl Summer of Code, have like a paid fellowship for women and non-binary engineers getting started. So highly recommend. Uh, some general stats about us. Um, we are smaller than GitHub, but it's pretty cool. So right now, 1.3 uh, million repositories have built on Travis, about that many CI jobs, and that much compute time per month. Um, so what exactly is happening in all of that? Um, so to back up, why do you need CI? So imagine you have a project where you have to implement some stuff. Maybe it's homework. Maybe it's uh, a product uh, you're working on. You get this feature request. OK, we need, to imp we need to write this. You write it all at once. You try and fit it back in. And it always goes great. Everything merges. It's fantastic. Um, generally, there's some testing that needs to happen. Generally, you end up with checks. Maybe you end up doing more and more like shorter and shorter components, especially if you have multiple engineers working on a code base together. Uh, everyone's changes happening all at the same time is totally not a recipe for chaos. So this is where CI comes in. Um, so continuous integration, integration being like, let's get our changes in, continuous being happening all the time. That said, to con as I go through this talk, there's a bit of phrase overloading here. So CI is both the process and the concept of continuous integration, like the best practice of moving stuff into the code base over time, as well as like literally the tool. So when we say this project has CI, they probably follow CI best practices using a CI tool. So it's a bit of, bit of conflated uh, terminology, but both refer to the kind of the same thing. The biggest thing about CI that you uh, talked about last week is uh, testing. So I'm going to talk from an industry perspective. Uh, John Britton showed a little bit before, um, but testing. So code is tested, or it should be. If it's not, please write tests. It helps. <laughs> it's a good idea. Um, uh, or my favorite is the YOLO merge, where you just sort of send it to master and hope. Also good. But um, all modern testing language, in fact, even Fortran, have testing frameworks, so use them. In JavaScript, uh, there's Jasmine, Mocha, Jest, a bunch of others. Python has uh, unit tests built into the uh, standard library, but there's some interesting test runners. Nose, nose tests is one I've used. Pi.test is another. All sorts of good stuff. Um, many languages, Go, have, uh, have tests built in. Ruby has RSpect. Like, they all exist. So uh, you can go and find them. Also, look up Fortran. It's kind of neat. Um, so types of tests. Um, there's, you can look at it from a few different angles. So, and I am going to compress all of quality engineering into about five slides. So apologies to any quality engineers in the, off, in the audience. Um, it's a great spot if you're into automation. So your tests can go both into automated or manual tests. I'm going to talk about uh, automated tests, functional versus non-functional tests. Functional being like, we're going to test a function. Non-functional being like reliability, security, sort of operational things. So automated, um, the machine follows a script that you've written or someone on your team has written. And you assert an expected result and verify that the assertion is true. Sort of like a programmatic um, version of checking a hypothesis, only unlike physical and social sciences, we're going to go back and change our results until we get the hypothesis. Please don't do that. <laughs> except here. So we're going to set like, oh, this string, this output is true. We expect it to be true. Uh, it's not true. I'm going to go and fix my code until it is true. Um, 
So we're checking, that's, we'll write tests beforehand or after, gen beforehand's a good idea to check that things are working the way they should. Um, as a side note, manual tests, this is literally someone manually going in and checking. Good idea to do it uh, at times, but CI is really concentrated on automated testing. Then functional tests also are broken down into different categories. Um, so the root word function here is like uh, programming functions. We're going to test a function. Uh, so there are subcategories, unit tests, integration tests, component tests, others too. This is a classic diagram I just felt like I had to throw in there. You start with your unit tests, fail fast on the unit tests, and then work your way up such that a component test tests like a package, a module, a larger part, integration test tests how things work together, and end-to-end -end is like an entire flow. So if you're writing a testing suite, a good idea is to start with unit tests. Does this method work the way I expect? So examples. Here's a method out of our front end. I will look at it later. Uh, it's generating the build status badge. Uh, I'll show it to you. But literally, the build is passing. Let's make this into a markdown thing. You can put into your GitHub readme. Um, that's our method. Here's our test. In a great irony of software engineering, the test is longer than the method. But it's, it's good. It, what it's doing is saying, OK, here's the assertion. Uh, it generates a markdown image with a particular string that looks like this. Uh, if this is changing, then we're going to fail for whatever reason. So uh, if this test passes, we haven't broken anything. Uh, this is great. Um, if it hasn't, then maybe there, we need to go back and take a look. Good things to test for, just backing up in general, uh, things work the way they should. Like a user can see the things they are supposed to be able to see. The string is generated the way we want the string to be generated. Or things fail the way they should be failing. A user can't see the stuff they're not supposed to be able to see. That's, that's a good one to keep in mind, because users should not be able to see admin things and vice versa. So stuff, the idea with testing is stuff should change only when you attend it to, and you update the tests accordingly. So if you write your tests beforehand, this is a whole framework called TDD, uh, Test Driven Development. Uh, lots of folks use it. So that way you know the code you are writing matches the output you are expecting out of it. Just a general statement is it's really important to keep in mind that unlike student work um, or unlike personal work even, software engineering tools are for teams. So this is, the testing is to help engineers keep stuff from breaking things that impact other people, breaking production in unexpected ways so that when the deployment goes, we don't, this side issue has happened. It can also function as a kind of documentation. This is what I did. This is what this method is supposed to do. These are the results we expect. And this is the stuff you can rely on. So if there's no documentation in a repository, shake your head and go read the tests. Um, a, so separating out. So after we've gone through tests, um, in uh, tests happen when we're doing a software build. So we're going, I have this code. I've written it. I've written the tests. We're going to then build this code, uh, compile it maybe, uh, prepare it, and uh, turn, it, turn it out to the world. So this is just a, the next section is just on like builds and building. Any burning questions in the meantime? OK. So builds and building. Build can both be like a verb, like build this source code into something. And this is really interesting, and I'm going to skip over this a lot, but compiled versus interpreted languages. So some languages need to be turned into a source code that is executable. Others, it's less clear cut. So builds versus uh, interpreted languages may jump straight into testing. Sometimes there are optimizations that happen first. Uh, this is some really cool stuff in computer languages. This is also true. Um, so builds can get rather long. This is a classic XKCD, and I felt like I had to include it. Um, a build is also like the end result. So the build from yesterday was broken, but today the build passed. That, that refers to all of the change um, that happened between now and then. So it's the bit, we can say the build as the end result of a build process. So we went through the 10-minute build process, and then we have the build. It functions as a kind of audit log. So uh, here, here you can see me going back and forth with our technical writer, uh, talking about, like, this is actually a documentation discussion in which apparently I had a really hard time with the passive voice. So uh, it was thought to look great. 
Uh, there in specific is highlighting the GitHub status checks. So when we, when we post uh, to GitHub, uh, we see, we'll see both the uh, positive status, like yes, this passed, the negative status, no, this did not. And um, it functions as kind of like a yes, this is what this commit did, this is what that commit did. GitHub's really nice and gives this in our UI, but the general concept um, stays anyway that um, builds are highlighted uh, and you, like, the statuses are highlighted, you can see where it changed. I think the last one was a merge into master in which we also fixed a hyperlink. So why CI in general as entire systems as opposed to like, why don't I have a single machine that just sort of we test on every so often? It's to solve this problem. Hey, it works on my machine. It's gonna be fine. It's always fine. Um, and there are many different flavors of this problem. So reproducibility, um, standard environments mean we can eliminate like special customizations and sort of hacks from influencing the results. So maybe you've installed uh, additional dependencies, maybe you have special scripts that when you know one thing happens, go do the other thing. Uh, if someone else doesn't have that, or even if your production environment doesn't have that, then what? Uh, software is built on top of the entire ecosystem of dependencies below it. So if those things don't exist, you might have a failure in production that's really hard to debug because it works on my machine. It also helps people check other people's work. If we know the environment is standardized, we have this clean, clean installation, we know the environment is standardized. Oh, this build failed on the separate machine. It must be the code or how we're integrated or how we're working with this like clean environment, which we can fix as opposed to say, um, we know it say it's we're working on a, an individual laptop. Oh, let's all crowd around and try and figure it out and hope it works in production. So reproducibility um, is a big deal around uh, CI systems and why do we have external CI systems. Also, just a shout out, collaboration is really important um, because if we have these environments that we sort of can trust or at least can predict, um, people don't need access to the exact same thing. So I can go and work from wherever, I can go and work from headquarters in Berlin or I can come back here or whatever, because we're not necessarily looking at the exact same installations, um, we know we have some reasonable environments, reasonable predictable environments, other contributions can be included. Also, this is a big deal in uh, open source and uh, corporations because of this sort of wide distribution. I also touched on it really, uh, tidy deploys are a big deal for CI. So a standard environment that looks like the production environment, or even a standard environment that we can configure the production environment to look like any flavor of that. Uh, it gives a better view of what will happen when the code is merged in. You don't actually want to test on production most of the time. Not, it's one thing to feature flag. It's another thing to do real live tests on production. Um, we would rather get our testing environments as close to production as possible, as opposed to just say we have customers hope that they don't see the problem. Um, it also helps, again, prevent like forgotten customizations. Oh, I have this machine. Before the last Mac update, I installed this Ruby environment. This happened to me. I updated my operating system. Now it's all gone. Thank goodness I have another. Um, I'm not testing on my own machine. Otherwise, that would have taken forever. Uh, we also see things like faster development uh, with CI systems. So this was a really interesting study that we heard about which is that CI both improves confidence in co the code in an application and the pull request submitted to it. So people, when there is CI, people feel better about the code they are maintaining and they feel better about the pull requests they are receiving. So projects with CI will release about twice as often and pull requests are accepted about almost two, but 1.6 hours faster which is a big deal both in open source, that means people can contribute better, as well as uh, in business, that means uh, you can you know, move things along and people's valuable time is, you can get more, more distance from it. There's a link there. Um, there are a lot of other interesting studies on CI out there as well. Uh, my email is at the end of the slide. I would love to send links later, but that's a good one. Also, CI will then, function as kind of this automation hub. So I have this big long list, uh, this big long list here of uh, coverage tool of different things that will happen. Code coverage being like how much of our code is tested. You may or may not want to test all of it. Some of it is illogical to test. 
but some of it um, really should be tested. Other things, linting, you know, does this follow the best practices for syntax? Some languages will let you get away with syntax that you shouldn't, but it does make it harder to maintain and harder to read. You know, language runtimes. Does this run on Python 2.7? Does this run on Python 3.6? Does this run on Python 3.5? Uh, for libraries, this matters a lot. So I have a library of you know, Python tests. Uh, going to make sure this works. This, everyone is using everything in Python 3, whatever. Uh, so I'm going to test that. I'm also going to backport it and just make sure this runs on 2.7, because maybe someone's on it. So you can do a lot of that with CI. Um, then dependency management, configuration management, these are all kind of, again, the libraries you're building on or the deployments you're doing, uh, and various other things. I threw in some like documentation generation. There's some really cool frameworks for that. Demo generation, really cool frameworks for that. So this is where we start hooking up CI to CD, uh, which we've talked about more. So CD being like either continuous delivery this is ready to be deployed whenever, or continuous deployment, this is deployed all the time, GitHub style. One way or the other, you need CI doing regular tests, because if we say every commit is deployable, conceivably we could deploy every commit, and if it's untested, we're back to the YOLO situation where we just hope. So that's, that's the CI CD uh, interaction. Also, CI jobs will often spawn autom like automated deployments, right? So, hey, this passes, I like it, it's on the branch that we allow to deploy, let's just go and deploy it. That tends to be more in the like, continuous delivery um, category. So tests ends up being really, uh, really, really important. If it's deployable every change or if it's deployed every change, we want to have high confidence in the deployments we are doing. So a couple examples and you will see some familiar faces. Uh, so these are just literally some build configurations I pulled out of open source. So we can have a look at what exactly is happening. Hey. Uh, so CS50 manual, it was a fabulous uh, little um, Travis YAML configuration to look at because, OK, you see the, uh, um, the merge here. Uh, David was merging in you know, pull request um, about last week, I think. And it was passing. And this was the Travis YAML. You can see the language, what version we're on, any sort of caching that's happening. The script is, do, is building that, making sure that the Jekyll build runs, and do all, does this web page, does this Jekyll um, project properly turn into the web page it's supposed to do? If it works, we're going to do a deployment. We're going to go to Elastic Beanstalk using this deployment uh, process. We're going to you know, use, these, use these secrets, which uh, you can't see because it's open source and it's uh, hidden. We're going to use these secrets to this part of AWS, app is named this, like the whole thing. And then in the last, in the last bit, we're going to notify a Slack room. I assume there's a deployment Slack room or some interesting Slack room in which everyone is cheering on the manual. Um, so we see CI both being like, hey, like do this build, make sure it works, do this deployment, and also tell people it's done. This is one of our projects. This is one of the biggest glue projects at Travis. Uh, this is Travis Build which takes this Travis YAML, this being a YAML configuration. Uh, YAML is, kind of, is a, like this sort of key value configuration language. So we're going to take Travis YAML, and we're going to turn it to bash, bash being a shell language, which the build is actually executed in. So this is a big, long uh, Ruby repository in which a bunch of things are happening. Uh, this is sort of the key part of this uh, build. So if we go back here, we have these three different tests. We're going to deploy it to uh, key.io. And then there's an additional like check these rake tests that happens after that sadly didn't fit on my slides. Um, so again, here, we're going to run these tests. Like beforehand, we're going to like pre-compile and clean everything. We're going to run the test, the, uh, the spec tests, Val do an additional validation test that we've written ourselves. And after deployment, we're going to send it to a uh, code climate. Code climate being another tool for kind of checking the health of your code. There are all sorts of awesome tools out there, by the way. Just I'm shouting out this one because it's in our repository, but go find there's some awesome ones out there. And then, you know, before the deploy, we're going to clean up. And then ultimately, we end up deploying it. Um, 
So we have this, this project that goes from uh, these individual steps, test, 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 to uh, you know, clean up and get ready, deploy if it's the right kind, and take it from there. So I have a quick demo. Uh, next, any questions before we get started? Okay. And let me make sure this works. I thought I could only do one thing at a time, so I pre-recorded it, but so I can pause if anyone has questions along the way. So here we see my Travis account, my Travis.org open source account. I'm going to go and enable my Travis, my demo Travis web um, project. So I did this cooking show style because the build is a little bit long. So here's the beginning of my pull request. Um, and there's the pull request itself. I'm adding features. Uh, I'm adding an emoji to the string here. So you can see the first project. I actually updated the test first, again, to, so that I could know what the output was supposed to be right there. These two tests needed that updated because they're checking the string. Take it from there. I'm going to go back. Let's see if I'm remembering my demo. I'm going to go back and head back over to my editor there and actually update the code. So now that I've done the test, I'm then going to update the code and say this is what is supposed to happen when you generate a markdown string. You're supposed to also have that emoji. And I pick tools because we're building things. You can see what emojis I like. And now that we've done that, we're going to save it. And I'm going to come over to my terminal. Um, that is my branch status. You can see what's happening. I'm going to add that file. I have a terrible habit of git add dot, which adds everything in the current directory. Don't do that habit. And then I'm going to commit it with a hopefully um, you know, clear uh, commit, uh, com commit message. I'm going to push that up. You know, this is just sort of basic, like this is just sort of the general commit, um, git commit and git management um, tools. You, there are desktop apps. I like my command line. We're going to take it from there. And now the build is going to run. So, build is running. See my pull request. That's my active branch. There's my build history. Apparently, I like gesturing with my cursor. And it's coming in. Uh, Travis will show the build once it in this current uh, page once it has started. So right now the build is going from, you know, question like a request coming into the Travis beginning of the pipeline being parsed through things like Travis build until the uh, worker is ready to start. And we take it from there. And here is the build coming in. So the first thing it's going to do is pull Git uh, Chrome stable, like uh, Chrome for the browser, but in headless browser mode, so we can test like that taking a while. And then um, it's going to you know, set up assets where we turn uh, this source code. This is, our, this is our entire front end, by the way. If you go to Travis-CI um, slash Travis Web on GitHub, Travis-Web on GitHub, I forked that project and have done this on our open source front end. So now it is building the front end, um, downloading the build archive, which is the sort of uh, some of these modules, some of these node modules that um, were set up in the prior build. Uh, there's a whole concept of if you have dependencies you can rely on, let's send them up to somewhere stable, in our case uh, S3, and pull them back down for the next build so we don't have to pull it every time. Now we're getting uh, the node version we need, which is kind of the, the underlying language here uh, for this build, getting uh, node 5. Uh, installing uh, the NPM modules, the node modules that we need, it, need again. And now we're linting. So we're checking, um, does this exist the way it's supposed to? Is the syntax correct? All that good stuff. Does it match the best practices? And now we're building the website into something that we can automate it, that we can test automatically uh, in the build. So it is going from source code to testable situation. And we're doing that. I, for better or for worse, I picked Travis Webb because it is a nice, clear JavaScript project you can go and look at. It does have a fairly long build, so it will build for a little while. 
Um, we, for some background history, we picked Ember because it works really well with our uh, Ruby applications on the back end. And we have this nice Ember project. There are a lot of great, um, great JavaScript frameworks that have come out recently, more recently. Ember is neat if you like Ember. Highly recommend all these things. Again, these are all ways of building uh, applications, building JavaScript applications, you know, performant web apps uh, in the browser. So uh, now we're generating. Yes, question. Are you, uh, so are you a contributor to the project? Um, the, let me pause real quick. Oops, too much of a pause. And we're back to the beginning. I'll figure it out. I personally, I contribute on in different parts. Um, so I'm on the product and support side. So odds and ends pull requests. I do a lot of reading our code because I end up explaining it to people. So I've pull requested to different configuration things. I've set up uh, different inf infrastructure things with people. But I personally don't work on the Travis Webb project. A lot of cool people do. Um, but I'm happy to try and answer questions if you've got questions about it. So. Yeah. Uh, if your project is not on GitHub, can you use Travis? Uh, you cannot use GitHub. You cannot use Travis without GitHub, though. Uh, you could, if you have another source control project, you could add a second remote, and you would then be testing off the GitHub remote. Um, it's a little iffy, but you, that is a way to do it. But right now, it is uh, continuous integration for GitHub projects. Uh, we actually grew out of the GitHub open source community, so we've, we've stayed super true to that. Other questions? Otherwise, I'll try and find my spot. OK. Let me see. And I think it was like halfway. Yep. Oh, wow, that's pretty good. OK. So we're linting. Going back to linting. The next things it will do is it will run all of the tests. Or af after it builds, it will run all of the tests. There. I think I counted about 800 plus tests for all of these different things in this uh, entire front end. I'll skip a little forward. Whoop. Backward. Sorry about this. Let's skip to the end. So dot, so I've skipped, skipped the building step. The dots here are the tests that ran and passed. The stars are the ones we skipped. Sometimes you want to skip tests because uh, whatever reason that, that project is, that component is still under work. It's not the best practice, but it is something that happens every so often. So now we are building all these tests, all 847 last I checked, and taking it from there. Yes? So you're not, it's not actually Travis, you're using some test from Travis? Travis is running the tests um, in, like, is running the uh, NPM tests, the, the node tests here. It's there is a test runner that is executing these tests. We are automating calling that test runner. OK, so I'm going back to my pull request. I'm saying it worked, or I'm checking it. All my checks have passed. I now, because this is an individual pull request, I'm going to be wild and crazy and merge my own pull request. Highly recommend you get a review. But I added three emoji. It is OK. It will survive. So there is my pull request. And went pretty quickly. But in review, um, builds and testing in general. So the main goal um, is to provide a way for tests to be run as development progresses rather than at the end. CI came in as a theory um, you know, in the 90s, but it's still a best practice that is being adopted. So we want tests to be run as the project is going so that we don't get to you know, these great merge days where we go, OK, let's see if everyone's code fits together. Oh my goodness, it doesn't fit together. Now what? Let's go back to the drawing board and figure it out. Uh, you have all that time that both requires, like, we need to figure out this problem, but also we did all this code and maybe it needs to be changed. Uh, maybe it needs to go away. If you do these small increments, test them as you go, merge them in as you go, uh, it's much more like, you don't waste time in quite the same way. It's much easier. You can also predict what other teams are going to do, because if you know everyone's tests are going to pass or they're not going to merge it in, right? then you know that there's a jet, like side effects are generally under control. Um, new features are tested with assuming the best practice of writing the tests with the features. And historical builds become a kind of living audit log for tests. So, like, yes, my build last month did this. This is what the output is like. Oh, we've changed it a lot. Let me go back and compare. 
or the last build that was successful did this, that, and the other thing. Um, my tests, my uh, project no longer is successful. What specifically has changed here? Um, let's go back and compare. When were these things done? Which commits had what status? Um, all there, there's tons of good data, tons of good information. And again, there, as you're doing your build, there are lots of different types of tests to include. So like um, the unit tests at the bottom, these are individual methods, component tests, integration tests, working your way up until you're testing the bulk of an application. Oftentimes people, again, will start with unit tests. If the unit tests don't pass, you know particular methods are wrong, go and look at those. And it, then it connects um, back into uh, CD and CI CD, both in open source and in business and in industry. So uh, CI and CD are getting more and more common. They are more or less considered a best practice, though of course every individual uh, environment, every individual corporation, every individual project has like different requirements. So um, I don't want to be like CI is for everybody, but CI is for everybody. Um, so it's both like a trend and a best practice. There are more and more, if you know your code is reliable at any given point and is tested and under control at any given point, you can do all sorts of interesting things around deployment, continuous deployment, other types of deployment, you know, changing around infrastructure, especially in kind of cloud native and all these cool stuff. So um, teams will use CI and CD for testing and deployment, also just general productivity. CS50 is posting to a Slack room. They're also all getting emails. They could be posting somewhere else. They could be notifying other things. We could be going back and saying, oh, we had an incident on our infrastructure. This is not happening with a manual. But say in another product, we had an incident. What happened to the tests most recently? Can we fix this? Oh, we need to fi fix this really quick. Let's, do, let's push this feature, make sure the test passed before we end up with an incident on top of our incident. So CI and CD are really deeply connected in that way either by making sure you can deploy whenever or deploying always on passing CI, like CS50 does. So any questions? This was like very high level, but I would love to talk more about it. Questions, concerns, either about Travis or, yes? Yeah, so we do a bit of a mix of that with the caching, but the rebuilt environment every time does deal with um, changes to those environments. So either like from, like from our infrastructure side or from like your libraries and dependencies. Uh, right, so we, do, we actually have a fairly continuous in infrastructure project, uh, infrastructure deployment, so we do that. Uh, it also works so that um, like as we, are changing, as we are changing our infrastructure, as we are changing, like we'll change infrastructure and Travis build at the same time, Travis build being the runtime side. So if there's a change to infrastructure, we need to change to Travis build. And so we have pretty continuous deployment. Um, we do have pre-built images. So we'll ten, we kind of have these catch-all images of like CI Garnet covers, like I don't remember off the top of my head, but it covers, you know, half a dozen languages and their various types. CI Amethyst covers like all the stuff on the JVM and their various types. And so we will kind of have these catch-all images and then when you select a language, we'll pull in all the specific stuff to it. It also lets for better, um, better um, like community involvement. So we'll have like the D language contributes to Travis Build. I personally have never written D, but it's a supported language. Sure. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. If you make a change to say like a readme file, is there like a way for like Travis to know like, oh, like that's not going to break any tests, so we should really be running all the tests based on this change? Uh, you can do like, you could, it depends on the workflow. So with Travis, I'm going to speak from Travis. From Travis specifically, you could just skip the entire thing by adding uh, brackets skip space CI uh, to the commit message. So you could skip the entire thing. You could set up a matrix build where um, you would set the environment variable. So this type of change would uh, have these kind of tests. And then you know, if we don't see any change or we want to pass it along, we could uh, do that differently. We could do something different. You could also like, get rid of it out of the readme on your pull request and then just, uh, or get rid of it out of the Travis YAML on your pull request and then put it back. I would still say run the whole test suite, though, because you don't know what changed. So. 
different stuff. But also, like, it will depend on project. So I can talk more, talk more to you afterward. Other questions? Other concerns about testing, CI? Other things? I can talk a little bit about how we use uh, Travis at Travis, which is kind of fun. We've had different situations where in order to fix the builds, we have to pass a build, but the build just stalled. That's really fun. Um, highly, highly recommend that situation. Um, we dog food all of Travis, both Travis uh, open source, closed source, and enterprise. So um, you can't push a change to, say, Travis build unless your Travis, uh, your Travis build passage passes. So if you're changing it around, it's, it's, it gets super interesting. Questions, concerns? Otherwise, I can call it early. It was fast. OK, well, thanks so much to Anna. And uh, with that, we'll wrap up for today. And next week, we'll dive in to talk a little bit more about scalability and thinking about taking the web applications we've been building just on our own computers and how we might scale them to be larger applications used by some number of more users. Thank you so much.